gathered here today to bring William Luster Lutheran home. At this time, Kevin will talk to us. Good morning. I don't know. Kevin's getting in. Good morning. My name is Kevin Skahan. William Lester Luke Green was my mother's brother. The Luke Green family has a long history in the Metropolis area. My great grandparents had a farm right here. This cemetery was once part of it. As a kid, I remembered a story that the land was donated to the cemetery district. Recently, I was corrected by Steve Miller the cemetery director, that my great-grandparents sold it for $5, and the deed is dated 1870. He also told me the first burial here was uh, ground in 1858. I now have a new fact for Steve, that my uncle will now be one of the last Luke Greens buried here, most likely. My mother wasn't a storyteller, but the two that I remember are how she had to walk five miles to school in the rain or the snow barefoot. The second one, as a young boy growing up in Southern California, the U.S. Forest Service had an air base at our town's airport. They flew World War II aircraft to fight fires. The planes that were used uh, were the TBMs, single-engine torpedo bombers, twin-engine F-7Fs and PBYs, four-engine B-24s, and the B-17s. One day, while watching a B-17 fly overhead, my mom told me that's the kind of plane her brother was shot down over Germany in World War II. I was probably around six or seven years old. As a kid, I grew up dreaming of becoming a pilot and a professional baseball player, as a lot of boys do. 
I was lucky to somewhat achieve that. I became a student pilot and played a few years of minor league baseball. My only claim to fame was being on Ozzy Smith's only minor league team he played on. I never did have a baseball hero. My hero was Lester. I found it unimaginable to guess what it felt like to get into a B-17 bomber for a mission, knowing you had a less than 50-50 chance of returning. I never knew how many missions Lester was on board until I read the article that Tara Temple wrote for the Metropolis Planet paper that it was his 35th. Memphis Bell flew 25 missions and returned to the States. At some point, the Army changed it to 35. I'm sure Luster was counting on returning to the States after the Menninger mission, just not 80 years later. I've never forgotten about my uncle. I'm grateful the United States government has not either. I would like to thank everyone that has been involved in returning Luster to his homeland. I am surprised at the attention that this has created here. My first thoughts were there would only be a few people here to honor my uncle. I've talked to so many wonderful people from all over the country to say that they will be here. I'm truly grateful and proud to have my best friend of 35 years, Betty Parlett. And you. And me. <laughs> Her deceased husband was a naval aviator during Vietnam, and also that my son. It will be his job to bring the rest of his family here in the future. Lastly, I would like to thank the Rolling Thunder Group for escorting Luster from Paducah Airport to the funeral home last Friday um, on one day's notice. Incredible. I was able to watch it on my phone in California. The same goes to the Patriot Guard for today's escort. It's so impressive. And last but not least, I'm sure that all of you took notice of the 600 flags from the airport. A special thank you to Just Jeff, a veteran that has taken on the mission to provide this honor to all fallen heroes. I was going to request a donation box for Jeff, but since the Patriot Guard and the Rolling Thunder are here, I have to split it up. And <laughs> Wouldn't want anybody fighting for it, but uh, it was amazing. Put the flags out. Beautiful. And at this time, we got two more speakers. One will be Patrick Windhurst, the state rep for the, I guess, the 17th district. And after him will be uh, Paul Mathis, who's a, a World War II reenactor, and he's really knowledgeable about the mission my uncle was on. And we'll close with uh, Brother Frank Furtham from the New Hope Baptist Church. So thank you for putting up with this transfer of uh, speech. And one more thing. One of the people I met gave me my uncle's hat. I guess her uh, mom was her age. Lester. And if I didn't show up, she kept us. which is best to do this. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Patrick Windhorst. I have the honor of serving as the state representative for the 117th district here in Illinois. I'm honored to have the opportunity to join you today as we lay to final rest a local hero. We gather here today to honor the life and legacy of Technical Sergeant William Luster Luckering, Luckering a man of exceptional courage, dedication, and sacrifice. We remember and celebrate his life, his service, and his remarkable journey that brings him back to us after 80 years. Luster's story is interwoven with the history of Massac County, where he grew up on the family farm and supported his family's business, where his family made many contributions and nurtured a sense of community. 
his service to our country, and his bravery and selflessness in the face of unimaginable danger continue to inspire us all. Luster volunteered to join the United States Army Air Corps, the precursor to the Air Force, at the age of 27. He served with the 816th Bomber Squadron, 433rd Bomber Group, 15th Air Force, as a radio operator, gunner, and crew chief. He flew 35 missions in a B-17G flying fortress in the harrowing skies of Europe during World War II. On July 18, 1944, during a bombing raid over Germany, his plane was struck by enemy fire. Despite the crew's efforts to survive, Luster and four others remained on board when the aircraft exploded. He was just 28 years old. For decades, Luster was among the many brave souls listed as missing in action. His family and community held on to hope and memories, never forgetting his sacrifice. We, we, we lay William Luster Lukering to rest at Round Springs Cemetery, near the very land where he grew up and where many of his family have found peace. His return is a testament to the enduring promise that our nation will never forget its heroes. It is a reminder of the courage and sacrifice that defines our greatest generation. Luster enlisted as war raged in Europe, Africa, and Asia. He volunteered. Records vary, but between 1,500 and 2,300 Massac Countyans joined him and served in World War II. Luster's story is one of many stories of courage and heroism, both known and unknown, of the service members from Massac County. Through their efforts, the brave men and women from our county joined in the defeat of tyranny and the triumph of the Allied forces. Hundreds of World War II veterans from Massac County would return home, raise families, and build our community. They would see an iron curtain descend upon the continent of Europe, a president assassinated, the success of the civil rights movement, men walk on the moon, the end of the Cold War, and the industrial age giving way to the information age. They would experience a time of unprecedented freedom and prosperity where our nation would be the strongest in the world. Technical Sergeant Luke Ring was one of 57 Massac Countyans who would not return home alive. They would not get to enjoy the blessings of liberty for which they fought and died. They would live on only in the memories of their loved ones and with the eternal gratitude of a nation made stronger by their sacrifice. Exactly 80 years after his passing, we are compelled to consider how we can honor Luster's legacy. We thank God for him and countless others who through a love of country or a sense of duty gave of themselves for the future of our nation. We remember that freedom has a cost and the cost is not cheap. It has been paid for with the blood, sweat and toil of those who have served our country. It has been hard won and should not be easily given away. We dedicate ourselves to defend the ideals they died protecting. Liberty and justice, freedom and equality. Those ideals that were proclaimed in our Declaration of Independence and enshrined in our Constitution. Let us honor Technical Sergeant William Luster Lukering by carrying forward the values he exemplified. Courage, dedication, and a love for family and country. His spirit lives on in the hearts of those who love him and in the history of this great nation. Rest in peace, Luster. You are finally home. Maybe I can speak loud enough where I don't need it. <laughs> anyway, I want to deviate first from script a little bit, if y'all don't mind, but we've only got one chance to do this. Um, I've, I met some wonderful people this morning at the motel, 
and I'd just like to ask for all the rest of our benefits, would all of the Lucring family please stand up and be recognized? Some of these people haven't seen each other in 50 and 60 years. everyone hear me, even on the outer fringes? We have two special guests that have flown, that have driven in, that I want to recognize because they made one heck of an effort to get here. Cindy Ulrich and Kim Horn, will you come forward? This is Cindy Ulrich. Her father was Dick Robertson. He flew in the Griffin aircraft, the 815th bomb squad. They were two squads ahead of Luke uh, Lusters. Her father witnessed everything that happened. Her father survived. And this is his grandson and her niece, Kim Horn. They came from Miami, Oklahoma, up here for this. My cousin Frankie, he's going to assist me. Y'all probably professionally know him as Frank, but he's family. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to say that honor is simply the morality of superior men. Once more, honor is simply the morality of superior men. In this life, there are few great men. There are only great challenges, which ordinary men are forced by circumstances to meet. William Luster Lucring, for we are gathered here today to memorialize, certainly falls into this group of men. During World War II, American citizens who were involved in agriculture or food-related fields were exempt from serving in the military as they were deemed essential to the war effort. William Luster and his father ran a dairy, and I'm sure Luster could have been exempt from service. However, he felt a sense of duty to fight America's enemies, even though he could have remained home and safe, yet still honorably serving his country in a necessary function of the war effort. This is a testimony to Luster's character right here. Luster was 27 years of age when he volunteered for the U.S. Army Air Forces on November 6, 1942. After completing training, now Sergeant Lutring was awarded his radio operator gunner, gunner's wings and was sent to Sterperone, Italy to serve with the 15th Air Force. Sergeant Lukring was assigned to the 5th Bombardment Wing, consisting of four groups, which were subdivided into four squads. Luster's bomb group was the 483rd. On the 28th July mission to Memmingen, Germany, Sergeant Lukring's bomb squad, the 816, consisted of seven B-17s. The carnage of that fateful mission to Memmingen has been lost to history until now. It was imperative at the time for the 5th Bombardment Wing to destroy Memmingen as it was a strategic German airdrome with at least 151 fighters stationed there. In World War II, B-17s flew in a very tight formation for interlocking fields of fire. This was essential as this type of formation created their safety net. Anything that affected the group's integrity, any loss of aircraft resulted in 13 less 50 caliber machine guns used to protect the formation. Well, first of all, two groups did not make it to the target. The 99th bomb group had turned around and returned to base due to bad weather. The Germans infiltrated the bomber's radio frequency 
and were actually successful in diverting the 97th bomb group to another target. Well, this resulted in 56 B-17s or 328 50 caliber Brownings lost. Well, this sets the stage for Tech Sergeant William L. Lukring and his B-17 tail number 297584. This sets up what they would encounter over Memmingen, Germany. <coughs> Lukering's B-17 was a Burbank, California built Lockheed Vega produced B-17G. All B-17s in World War II had a twin 50 caliber ball turret underneath the aircraft to protect the underside of the fort. But Luker, Lukering's B-17G had a newly developed radar dome in the location where the ball turret would be. For those of you that can see the picture of the aircraft over there, there's a giant blob kind of hanging out of the center fuselage on the bottom. <clears throat> The, uh, the location was where the ball turret would have been. And this is important because of what takes place during the air battle. As mentioned prior, Sergeant Lukering was a radio operator gunner. The radio room on a B-17 was located just aft of the bomb bay. And the new radar, which was officially named H-2X, but the air crew dubbed it Mickey, because the first time air crews saw this giant blob hanging from an aircraft, they scratched their head and said, it sure looks like Mickey Mouse stuff to me. Well, the name stuck. <laughs> so the, the H-2X was operated by a Mickey navigator. But the H-2X actually aided bombers to bomb accurately in bad weather. The radio operator gunner and the Mickey navigator carried out their duties in a very, very small cramped space. Being in such close proximity, I can only surmise that Sergeant Lukering and the Mickey Navigator, Lieutenant Thomas A. Trevor, who happened to be from Moline, Illinois, had become close friends. Tech Sergeant Lukering's intrepid, courageous, selfless act may have forever been buried in B-17G, 297584 in a field in Bavaria, Germany, had his remains not been identified 80 years later, and a story appeared in the local Metropolis Planet advising that he was coming home to Metropolis to be buried. As a World War II historian, I am fortunate to have several tools that aid me in my quest for information. I immediately became interested in the specifics of the Lukering crash. I was actually able to receive a copy of the official crash investigation report which was conducted by the 483rd Bomb Group. Within this report were detailed witness statements from the surviving men that had bailed out from the aircraft. This is key. All right, now that I have set the stage with the details that I found, I want to deepen the description of the event by reading the Deputy Group Commander, Lieutenant Colonel William S. Sperry, his eyewitness account. Now ordinarily, being the group Deputy Group Commander, he would have been piloting one of the lead planes. But for this mission, he went along as an aerial observer, actually in the tail gun position of another aircraft. So he had a panoramic view of what was going on behind him. And I'm quoting, on 18 July 1944, the 483rd Bomb Group went into the assigned target area, listen folks, went into the assigned target area without fighter escort or other group support. As the initial point or the IP was approached, approximately 75 fighters swept by the group formation on the right making a wide turn to the right in preparation for the tail attack. When the 483rd group executed the turn onto the bombing run, the four separate boxes went into a box and trail formation, one right after the other. <clears throat> While the turn was being executed, 
The aforementioned fighters, supported by now an, an additional force of at least equal enemy fighter strength. The estimated total enemy fighter strength was now 175 to 200 when the tail attack was made. Seven airplanes of the 816th Bomb Squadron were shot down. They were in the number four box. And the entire enemy fighter strength made a concentrated attack on those seven B-17s. Three B-17s were shot to pieces while in level flight and while maintaining their positions in formation. A fourth went down, apparently shot out of control, and broke apart as soon as it went into a spin. The three remaining aircraft of the 816th drifted out of formation and appeared to be out of control, two of which were beginning to burn. So one of these, he observed, had to have been Luster's aircraft. Several parachutes were seen, although a number of crew members were actually thrown from their ships, and it's unknown whether their parachutes functioned or not. A considerable number of enemy fighters were actually shot down by the gunners in these ships as the attack was being made. But the fighter firepower was overwhelming. The fighter attack was executed in waves of five and six ships in a close javelin formation, closing directly on a level with the tail of each B-17. The fighter waves concentrated on two or three ships on an attack and fired only on the rearmost airplanes. This describes the attack on Luster's B-17. The fighters then moved up to the number three box after destroying the aircraft of the 816th Bomb Squadron, and five ships of the 817th were destroyed in the same manner. Twelve remaining aircraft of the 483rd Bomb Group reached the target and dropped their bombs, for which the group was awarded a Presidential Unit Citation. This is signed Willard S. Sperry, U.S. Air Force. Back to my work. During the violent and raging air battle, six crew members were actually able to parachute to safety. These men spent 10 months in a POW camp, and upon their release, their eyewitness statements were taken as part of the overall crash investigation and missing air crew reports. Let me tell you, B-17s went on bombing missions day after day after day in World War II. They were shot up and they were sadly shot down. And for 80 years, the selfless, heroic actions of a Southern Illinois farm boy were buried in the ground in Bavaria, Germany, and the pages and pages of official 15th Air Force documents. Based on two crew member statements, here is what happened in that aircraft after the pilot gave the bailout signal. The first witness has been identified as Howell Witherspoon. And he writes in his testimony, as he was specifically being asked about Sergeant Lukering, and I quote, the radio room was hit hard by 20 millimeter cannon shells, and there must have been casualties there. All right, with that established, there was a Cajun on board, Lieutenant Herbert LeBlanc from New Orleans, Louisiana. And he said that he actually witnessed Lukering's struggle to save Lieutenant Trevor, and I quote, immediately before I jumped from the nose escape hatch, I heard Lukering call to the pilot, the Mickey Navigator is shot, the Mickey Navigator is shot. I believe Lukering attempted to get Lieutenant Trevor out of the plane and died in the attempt. Lieutenant LeBlanc felt so strongly about what he witnessed that he wrote an additional personal affidavit to the officers investigating. And again I quote, had pilot Lieutenant John Hommel so desired he could have saved his own life, but he died in order to give every man on that crew sufficient time to leave our plane. 
which was burning from both wings. Hommel had often said that should our ship ever catch fire, his one hope would be that he had the presence of mind and the fortitude to handle his plane to enable his crew to get out of the ship. LeBlanc goes on further to say, I honestly say that he was not lacking. I believe such heroism should not go unrewarded. Likewise, Tech Sergeant W.L. Lukering could have certainly saved himself, except for his attempt to save Lieutenant Trevor. LeBlanc goes on further to say, if it is possible to do so, I would like to recommend both of these men for such reward as we are able to give them. Well, sadly, that never happened. Well, now we know what happened over Bavaria on that July day, 80 years ago, inside B-17G, 297584. And 80 years later, we know that Tech Sergeant William Luster Lukering, a Southern Illinois farmer's son, performed an extraordinarily courageous act a selfless act of valor to attempt to save his precious crewmate. In the book of John, chapter 15, verse 13, Christ admonishes us, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. People, this chapter and verse is William Lukering's legacy. Thank you. So you all know me. I'm Paul's cousin. <laughs> a pastor, by the grace of God, Dr. Frank Forthman, Jr. I speak to you today as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but I see, speak to you also today as a proud citizen of the United States of America. I speak to you today as a Navy veteran. I have a flag on my tie that was given to me by a Vietnam veteran. A Navy flag, and our American flag. I'm reminded today, on this occasion, of the meaning and the, the symbol of the flag, of the cross, and of the Bible. My father-in-law was a waste gunner in World War II. He flew 35 missions. 32 of those missions were documented as covering enemy territory and releasing their bombs. He made it home. <coughs> but we never knew his story. We didn't know his story till after he passed because he wouldn't tell his story as so many uh, that you know today are the same way. I say this because I, I believe that it is very important for us to forever be grateful and thankful for the greatest generation who gave their lives selfishly defend our nation and the freedom not only of our nation but of the world. I've been blessed in my lifetime to have many friends who fought in World War II. In Normandy, Iwo Jima, at Omaha, on ships, planes, and the battlefield. One of my dearest friends was a Navy medic who arrived at the last of the second wave on Normandy, who cared for those soldiers, Marines, who fought so gallantly, knowing what was waiting for them when they got off of those huge boats. And yet they went. If we don't tell their story and if we don't share their sacrifices, then their story and their sacrifices will be forgotten. And much of what we take 
today in our hearts, knowing its value and worth, will one day be taken for granted. So we've gathered together as a humble and grateful community to lay to rest the ashes of Tech Sergeant William Lukering Luster. We're reminded of the cost of freedom and liberty. We are reminded of the ideals of patriotism and the love of country. We are reminded of the greatest sacrifice to be offered, which is one's life. You know, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, Paul shared with the church, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's what God asks of us. But the United States military, when we take the oath of office, asks us to be willing to sacrifice our life. To give all for the name of freedom and country. His oath, his enlistment, his service, his death remind us of the place that the American flag and the Holy Bible have held in the history of our nation, whether in times of conflict or in times of peace. I can remember a time when the pledge was said at the beginning of every school day. That's not done anymore. I can remember when the Ten Commandments hung on the walls of Congress and in the courthouses of our land and in our schools. I can remember when the, when the flag was respected and all would stand and salute or cover their hearts and now we see so many kneel or not stand at all. I remember a time when those servicemen and women had their Bibles in their duffel bags, their letters from home. I think it's time that we need to dust off our Bibles, put our hands over our hearts, and pray for our nation. John 14, 1 through 6 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house, or many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said, Lord, I don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Of course, Jesus was getting the disciples ready for his own death. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. My father-in-law made it home. My wife was his youngest of nine or seven, seven children for him. I have a letter that he wrote to his dad in one of these conflicts where their plane was shot to pieces and he manned his gun and he didn't leave his station and although it hardly ever happened, he was credited with downing enemy aircraft. He received his bronze star. And I share that only to say this. I was blessed to read that and know the horrifying, horrifying things that happened to some of these men. But on this piece of paper, the last thing he says is only by the grace of God am I able to send you this letter today. I'd like to read to you 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And it says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of uh, ourselves. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction is but for a moment is working for us a far more than exceeding, exceedingly an eternal weight of glory. For we know that if this earthly house, this body, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And in this we groan. So we are confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body than to be present with the Lord.
we have gathered today to lay to rest these remains, to welcome back a hero, a true hero. We hold on to this hope that on this faithful day when he went down with his plane and his comrades, <coughs> that the Lord himself was there to meet him and take him home. In Hebrews chapter 12, my last verse, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down at the right hand. The throne of God. I would pray with all of my heart. that William Luster Lucre knows that we are grateful and thankful for his sacrifice and those that went down with him. We are reminded today of those who came before us and of those who made this gathering today possible. We live today in a nation that's still free. The only ones who can determine the future are you and I. They paved the way. They gave their lives, their service, their time. Family members, lost loved ones. I heard some of the family say, oh, how wonderful if his closest family could have seen this day and knew it was going to happen. What a blessing that that would have been to them. We are thankful not only for those who laid down their lives, but the families that lost their loved ones and their friends. But the sacrifices that they made. It is my greatest privilege honor to thank God for Sergeant Lucarine's sacrifice. Amen. 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 May we pray. Father God in heaven, as we have gathered here today in this beautiful place, we thank you for a wonderful, blessed day. The sun shines and the breeze blows, and so many folks from so many different walks of life have come and gathered together. Father, we thank you for William, the life that he lived, the family that he loved, comrades he served with and the sacrifice that he made. We have gathered to lay to rest his remains to bring them home, but Father, we believe in our hearts that he's with you. And so Father, bless this family that is left behind. Comfort them in this day. These friends and these neighbors. Bless our servicemen and our service women, Father. Keep them safe and bring them safely home to their families. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. And the hope is ours because he lives. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Thanks. Um, we came in yesterday, went to the airport. I saw all the people getting out with the flags, and there were like 36 of them, which was amazing. And Jeff asked, who will be back here tomorrow to help pick up the flags? And like four people will raise their hands. So if anybody can come out to help with the flags, that'd be cool. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I guess we're going to meet up in town at the 
the Italian restaurant, Cordelloni's. Anybody Corda wants to come up? And, uh, what is it? Cordovinos. Cordovinos. <laughs> and uh, drink some wine. And uh, so anyway, anybody that wants to get together and chat, that would be great. And I should do better there after a couple glasses of wine. <laughs> <laughs> chaplain at the VFW in Vienna, and I've been hundreds of barrels for veterans. And I'm reminded of a saying that we use a lot, that all gave some, <coughs> and you can believe it, William Lookery gave all. But for people like him, that we can breathe free air in this country. I don't think I'll need a mic, I got a loud voice. <laughs> so we are assembled here to pay a tribute of lasting respect to our departed comrade. When the call of our country was heard, William Lutherine answered, self was forgotten in the cause of a greater good. As a brave man, he marched away with a biting fate as God, his country, and his flag. The red of country's flag was made redder still by his heroism, the white more stainlessly pure by the motives which impelled him, and the starry field of our nation's glory banner has been glorified by the service that he has given. American ideal. God bless him. Commander.
Okay. us all, we extend these final earthly tributes to our departed comrade. Accept our prayers in behalf of the soul of the departed servant. Welcome him to thy house to rest in peace. Look with mercy upon the loved ones bereaved by his passing and comfort and console them through thy own tenderness. These things we ask humbly in thy name. Fellow Patriots, walk through for final salute for Technical Sergeant William Lugery. Fall in. Thank you all. Truly is a blessing. I will play it, huh? Absolutely. 